Okay, so uh, I wasn't as uh, thorough as the others and didn't uh, write up my lecture notes. I'm, allegedly, I'm writing a book on these sorts of things and, uh, well, on sort of these parts of statistical mechanics. Um, these bits of the book haven't been written. There are some bits you can find on my webpage that are written, but the, these bits are. But uh, I think pretty much everything I talked about um, is covered in various places. I guess so the one unique feature of these lectures is I put stuff together. Um, so for the icing model, the classic review, just absolutely beautiful uh, by Schultz, Madison, Lieb in 64. It's in Rev Mod Fizz, I think. Um, done exactly the way I describe it um, is done as section two of a paper from a few years back that I wrote called uh, Free Parafermions. It's, uh, we, oh, I'm going to talk about parafermions today, but uh, the section two is just on icing and done basically exactly the way and in great detail. And then there's bits in there that I've actually never seen anywhere else. Maybe they're probably somewhere, but never saw it. And by the way, Schultz, Madison, Leaf solved the, f the full two-dimensional classical icing model. Um, there's actually a whole book uh, by McCoy and Wu on the icing model, but their methods are uh, these, using these toplets matrices and different. It's a great book, but uh, not the way... Uh, it doesn't lend itself as easily to uh, the 1D quantum stuff. So for the Kataev chain, I mean, the original Kataev paper is beautiful and simple. Everybody should read that. And then some of the added things like um, including Ivanov's, uh, this, these matrices for the uh, exchange for the non-abelian statistics is reviewed very nicely in Jason Alessia's notes. Also, the construction of the topological invariant that I it was straight out of that article. And he also talks about P plus IP. He also talks a lot about uh, how to realize these experimentally. He reviews lots of things, stuff that I didn't touch on at all. The parafermians, that's what I'm going to talk about uh, today, in the fir at least at, in the first hour, although it's started a little late. So a little sure I'm going to talk about parafermians today. And there's a review article uh, that I wrote with Jason uh, uh, about, well, I guess, almost a year ago now. Um, and again, this is there's both theory and um, experimental uh, bits. You can probably guess of the two of us who wrote which bits. And uh, and if I have some time at the end, I'll give you a lightning introduction to uh, anionic braiding infusion in some of the mathematics and the physics that well, mostly the mathematical structure that underlies that. I hope I'll have a little time to maybe a half hour to outline that. And and there's a bunch of places. You can do that. I think the best that I know of, there's a whole book that John Preskill wrote on uh, quantum computation in general, but he has a later chapter that's on topological quantum stuff. And it's not on the archive, but it's all on the web somewhere. He's never finished all that. I think recently he actually updated it. So he, uh, it's maybe he will, quote, finish it someday, or maybe it'll just always evolve. But it's there for free on the web. So it's a beautiful work. And just learning about quantum computation in general is a great place to go. So uh, that's good places to look, and all these places you'll find references to the original literature. A lot of the original literature is actually really nicely written. Um, okay, so uh, one of the things I tried to emphasize in these lectures uh, is there's this close connection between spin systems, some of the very old physics of like the icing chain and this, quote, new physics of the Kataev chain. So what Kataev brought, as I said many times, is this insight that if you think about the chain in terms of fermions, um, well, then you learn new things. But it's important to remember that some stuff in the spin language is much more obvious. So the existence of an ordered phase in icing, well, it's really easy to understand. The spins, that, that, uh, if you tune the couplings appropriately, the spins all line up. In the classical 2D model, that's even more obvious, maybe. Um, but... Uh, so, but that and that phase is not obvious to understand in the fermionic language, and that's of course why people didn't really discuss it for a long time. But so, for your in, intuitive purposes, uh, thinking about spins is a good thing, and you just have to then be careful and understand how to do it. So then, um, the idea behind parafermions is you take a spin system with Zn symmetry, or let me put spins in quotes. And so what I mean by that is your Hilbert space, uh, to be fancy a second, would be Cn cross Cn cross Cn. And what that means, it's an n-state system instead of the two-state system we used in icing. 
So these models go way back. They're called clock models or a special case. Um, that is the three-state POTS model. So I'm just going to say in words, in three-state POTS model, um, uh, it would be a classical two-dimensional lattice model, and you'd have three states per site, and you have an SN symmetry. So the N state POTS model, um, the, you have the uh, N states per site, and the interactions Okay, the permutation symmetry, SN symmetry. And so then if you think about that for a second, all that means is that the only thing you can tell, say, if you have an interaction between two adjacent spins is whether the two spins are the same or whether they're different. That's the only thing that's S and invariant. And so I won't write down that Hamiltonian, but yeah, I, I mentioned this briefly for icing, how to go from a, a classical model to a quantum model. And then I learned later that, in fact, the car covered that last week, so you've heard that. But so if you do that with these classical models, then you come up with a quantum, quantum quote, spin chain. I'll call these spin chains, but these aren't SU2 symmetric. They're just ZN symmetric, so people still call these things spins loosely. So let me just now restrict for the rest of the lecture to the three-state case. So I guess we'll call this the three states pots chain or quantum pots chain. So again, the space of states, you'll have a three state system at every point of some chain. And let me write out the Hamiltonian is, uh, well, let's write it up here. So there's two kinds of terms that are exactly like the terms we had for icing. So there's one term, well, it can't flip the spin, but it's cyclically commuted. I'll define these operators in a second. But the two kinds of terms basically play the same role. One of them changes the spin, and the other one measures the relative value of the two adjacent ones. So these operators are defined. Let me, sorry, let me use these conventions in the paper that Jason and I wrote. So tau looks like that. And let's think of that as a shift operator. So it just basically, you've got a three-state system. It cyclically permutes the states of that three-state system. And then sigma, so this is like sigma x in icing in, in that sense. But it's a sh it shifts it instead of flips it. And then sigma is going to be like sigma z, obviously, and that one will go 1 omega omega squared. And for the rest of today, omega will be 2 pi over 3. To generalize this idea to Zn is pretty obvious. Omega becomes e to the 2 pi over n and so forth. OK? So that's, so that's the model. It's nice. Um, one thing to note now, again, so I said this was like sigma x. Sigma is like sigma z. But instead here, we have tau cubed equals 1, cyclically permuted all the way around, and we have sigma cubed equals 1. But then we also have these aren't Hermitian. That's why I had to write tau plus tau dagger. And so sigma squared, it's easy to check. Sigma squared is sigma dagger, and likewise tau squared is tau dagger. So that's both are pretty obvious. If you don't believe me, multiply. And then the interesting thing is with these definitions, sigma tau, well, you, they don't anti-commute, but they commute up to a phase. Okay. And, oh, okay. Well, I'll say it in words. Remember, I made a big point of it. So what this does, it, this acts non-trivially at the jth site acts on all the sites, acts non-trivially on the jth site. OK. Uh, right, so this is, th th this, is the, uh, this is the kicker. So there in Freising, we have a minus one. Now, anti-commuting 
is much nicer than picking up a phase. Because the point is, anti-commuting, you just say two objects anti-commute. You know, you change order, you pick up a minus sign. But here, you have to be careful. You have to say which order you put them in. Because, of course, just to be pedantic here, in this case, tau sigma would be omega inverse sigma tau. So you have to say which one go, goes first. So it's, it's already a more complicated notion. And this is why these things over the decades have not been as widely studied, because that makes life infinitely more complicated than Ising. So this model that I wrote down, in fact, not only is there not some nice spiffy way of solving it like with the fermions there, this isn't even solvable via the beta ansatz unless h equals j. That's the only case of, which turns out to be the critical point like I said. So in fact, yeah, let me write down the phase diagram of this model. It looks exactly like icing. So if you plot h over j, then there's a critical point for the three-state model. Um, and so then this is ordered. And you can think of it as the Z3 symmetry is spontaneously broken. That Hamiltonian is a full S3 symmetry, but let's just talk about the Z3. And then this is disordered. And with a critical point in between. Already, again, a big difference. If you go to this model for n greater than 4, so the 5 or 6 or 12 state model, um, has two phases like this, but this is no longer even a critical point. This is a first order phase transition. So lots of differences, but anyway. But at least the three state cases, at least in this sense, like that. Okay, so that's the model. And now, of course, these lectures are supposed to have something to do with topological this and that. And so now we can take this model and we can rewrite it in terms of parafermionic variables. Just like we wrote the icing chain in terms of fermionic variables. And to make the definitions, I'm a, to emphasize this fact that we discussed a little bit, uh, you know, I kept saying, you know, the string does, you know, you can put the string wherever you want. Um, when I first wrote a paper on this, I made the string go to the left just like I did before, but I remembered looking at the review article Jason and I wrote, for technical reasons, we ended up making the string go to the right. So just to emphasize, this is a convention. Um, let me write out the definition with the string going to the right. Uh, and we put a dagger there, well, just because that turned out to be, be useful. And I guess I have to then go from A all the way up to L. Okay, so now you plug that in. So just a little bit of algebra. Those of you still doing homework, although I suspect uh, your motivation to do homework this afternoon will be probably low, so maybe I won't go ahead. But if you did the home, if you did, you can easily check now, plug these in. So for the same, oh, sorry, bef let me, before I plug in the Hamiltonian. So again, just like tau and sigma from which we built these, what you get is, well, alpha cubed equals one. And, but so now, Again, you take alpha B, alpha C, and you write them in the reverse order, and you pick up that phase omega. But like I said a few minutes ago, well, you can't just um, say a minus sign. You have to say, is it omega or omega inverse? And with this definition, you get that. 
again, which, which sign you get depends on your conventions, but you always get a sign there. So it depends on whether this one is great, is that for, so sort of obvious, but that has huge consequences. All right, and then you play the same game we did with icing slash Kataev, and then you get, sorry, I'm going to raise it. So it looks, again, exactly of the same kind of thing we had for Kataev. It's just bilinear in these fermions, but now these things don't square to one. They cube to one. So this is, has, turns out, this has got to be neutral. It doesn't have a string. Obviously, the original Hamiltonian has no strings, so you have to take something dagger times something so that the string here cancels, and so you get that when you work it out. It's bilinear, and, but then, of course, you have to remember to add the Hermitian conjugates, too. Okay, so that's what you get. So, so far, it looks so good. And then um, everyone who does this has this excited moment, say, good Lord, I can now solve this thing. I told you, you can't, but you always say, well, I'm smarter, you know, you don't believe when people tell you you can't solve things, or at least I hope you're always skeptical when people tell you something is impossible. And you think, my God, I'm so much smarter than everybody else. For me, this happened, I remember, for some reason, I was sitting in a cafe in Vancouver, uh, just working one morning, and uh, I just said, wait, this is ridiculous. I can solve this thing. How could nobody have noticed this before? Um, and, uh, but see, what happens is what kills you is this stupid sign here. Because if you remember, if we're with tr if something translation invariant like this is, in icing, it just boils down to Fourier transform. So you just take the Fourier transform of these alphas. Great. Do that. But then the kicker is, and then you can plug it in here. It's bilinear in the other ones. But the catch is the, the Fourier transformed expressions, so alpha of k, or whatever you want to call it, won't have this nice commutation relation, right? Because it's a sum of a bunch of them. Right, and when you take k and k prime, alpha k, alpha k prime, the Fourier transforms. Well, when you try and you know change order, well, some of them will be greater and some will be less than. So this it all gets messed up. So even though the caffeine has kicked in by now, you're feeling good. Um, <laughs> you then just have to I don't know go read a book or buy the newspaper or something like that. You realize that uh, it's not possible. So this that's what I said. So this is not. You, not, this method does not work to solve the model the way it, it does so beautifully for, for Isaac. No, no, because, yeah, yeah, so what happens if you try and do that, what you'll see is um, you, you commute, so this is a bilinear, you commute it with a linear, but you don't get a linear back again. In fact, that's easy to see because I've got an alpha dagger alpha, but if I have a, just an alpha here, I, I could get just alpha back, but I could get alpha dagger alpha squared, which is just alpha dagger here. So you get alpha dagger alpha dagger terms. So again, yeah. Yeah, that was the first thing I tried. And I said, yeah, I know that, but I bet you can sum them up. So. In any case, no, it doesn't work. So I should, as a, as a tangent here, this paper I mentioned before, um, I, I wrote a paper called Free Parafermions. And what turns out to happen, this was an observation not stated in the parafermionic language, but an observation made by Baxter 30 something years ago. If you take the Hamiltonian where you forget that term, and you forget that term, so it's a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, you can then solve it easily using this, but still even there you get these dagger terms, but what I showed in this paper is you can, s you can work your way, bludgeon your way through it. So I, in that paper I bludgeoned. He bludgeoned even more than I did, but uh, I came up with a slightly more refined bludgeoning. But anyway, so that works, but otherwise it doesn't.
Okay, so that's why this thing ran around. So these, this observation was made, I should say, by Fradkin and Kadanoff, these power fermions which were invented by Fradkin, uh, Kadanoff, long, long time ago, again, ninth circa 1980 or 81. Um, what they were thinking, they were thinking the 2D classical lattice model. Eduardo told me that, in fact, he had done it with the Hamiltonian. Kadanoff did it with the, uh, um, with the, uh, in the classical model. And of course, but you know, at that point, Eduardo Friedkin was a postdoc, Leo Kadanoff was Leo Kadanoff, so uh, guess which way they did it in the paper. Um, but in retrospect, they should probably should have done it this way. I think it's clear this way. But what they were thinking, so this is a, one example of some beautiful sets of physics, for those of you who know a little bit more about the formulas in the icing model. The way the fermion comes up, the icing model classical, you can think of it as taking an order parameter, uh, operator product with a disorder parameter. And the disorder comes from the duality and that gives you the fermion. And so that's, there's a generalization of that notion here and that's what they were thinking about. Anyway, so they came up with these things but then they quickly, you know, Eduardo told me he had the same, you know, you know, epiphany, you know, to crushing defeat an hour later when you work it out and realize this, this won't solve the model. But what this did do, what they didn't realize uh, 30 something years ago, is that you, um, can draw the same picture I drew for the Kataev honeycomb model. So if I do this for open boundary conditions, so I still got written up here, I guess down there. So again, I have these two parafermions for every site. I guess I just erased the alphas, but if you looked at the notation, for every site of the original lattice, I have two parafermions. Or if you wish, you might want to say I have four because I have alpha, alpha squared, Alpha, so I'd have alpha 1, alpha 1 squared, alpha 2, alpha 2 squared, because they can't do one, so two or four, but I've got parafermions per site. And again, when you look at this Hamiltonian here, so uh, even or not, if you go to the h equals zero limit, well, all you have are these interactions. And if you wish, this is something plus the Hermitian conjugate, so there are two interactions, so this is the j interaction, so it's two pieces, but there. So these guys dangle. So alpha one commutes with h in the limit h equals zero. Of course, if alpha one commutes, alpha one squared does as well, so if you wish, it's a z3 edge mode. Yeah, write this. Well, you have two or four, depending on your count. So if you look at it, so if you think about it, remember we have sigma and tau. Uh, is any of this still up here? No. So we have sigma and tau for each site. Um, just like in the, in the icing, we have sigma x and sigma z, right? And so in a way, it's built up like that. Now the catch is sigma and tau only don't square to one, they cube to one. So that's why I say, in a sense, I can say there's two, there's alpha one and alpha one squared. But, but otherwise, it's the same thing. You take a, remember, so the icing, it was sigma z times the string of sigma x's. So, so the question, so yeah, so you can define now a mixed variable to, so yeah, in a sense you could define, so I guess what you're saying, we could, I could say there's three fermions for site. I could say there's one, alpha one, Sorry, well, there's, there's the empty, there's alpha one, alpha two, and alpha one, alpha two. So I guess that's a way of rephrasing your question, which is fine, but since I can build alpha one, alpha two from alpha one and alpha two. Eh, so, so the moral is that that's a, a right question. What I say is how many is completely a convention dependent statement, and that's in a way maybe why you can't solve it. So, but at least, but the crucial thing is <laughs> alpha, so. The unambiguous statement is that alpha one commutes with the Hamiltonian for precisely the same reason that the Myron edge mode doesn't because it doesn't appear in it and it picks everything up. Good, yeah, sorry. That, I, at the end, my end, ignore the first words I said. The end answer to your question was better than the first one. Good, someone else have a hand? Okay, so that story is fantastic. And so that, so that's really nice. And, and again, of course, for the other end as well, so it would be alpha 2L 
And so then, to redraw that phase diagram, well, so remember I had disorder and order, so you think now, ah, well, it's just going to go exactly the same as icing. So now there's a phase down here, which somehow, in some sense, interpreted in terms of the parafermions, will be some kind of topological order. Okay. Um, and then there'll be a transition to a disordered phase. And, okay, so there's a couple things one can say. So that's at least sort of right. And I'll explain in what sense it's sort of right uh, in the next uh, few minutes. But there's a bunch of things you have to uh, take into account. Um, and, okay, so let me decide which order to do these things. Let's do... Okay, yeah, well, so let me say something about physics first, okay? Well, so, all right, so now you think, well, what does this mean? Well, so in, in the Kataev chain, it's easy to think. One of the things Kataev pointed out in the original paper, well, I can trap fermions, and if I can put a superconductor next to it, at least one can conceive of making this thing. Well, we don't have parafermions floating around in the world. You know, we're not made of parafermions in a sense this, in some sense, this is a peculiarly 1D thing. Um, so how do you, I can't trap parafermions in a 1D wire because I don't have parafermions to begin with. So I wrote a paper where I, I talked about this and what I talked about was this thing I call the strong zero mode. So that's what I'll tell you about in a few minutes. But, for, but, but and because in the historical order, even though I thought of this, I, I took forever to write my paper. And so then after I thought of this, but before, I actually wrote my paper, people showed that this idea I just said, well, you know, how, this is, how can you make parafermions? This is just sort of academic interest. That was certainly my motivation. So there were three papers. One was by um, Alicia et al., or maybe it was Clark. Clark, Alicia, and uh, Stengel. And the other one, I'm not gonna remember all the authors, but Nate Linder was the first author. They pointed out there is a way to realize this physics in a 1D system. And, but the trick was you had to think about higher dimensions. So they took a quantum Hall system. I'll say it this way. Let's take a big quantum Hall system in the one third or two-thirds state, turns out actually two-thirds a little better. And so I said this, we haven't derived this at all, but I said that, you know, there's these edge modes rolling around. And they said, well, okay, so now you carve out a trench in there. Okay, so you carve a really narrow trench. So this is fractional quantum hall state, one-third or. The point is in either of those states you have excitations that are charged one-third or two-thirds, and minus one-third, minus two-thirds. So you carve out a trench. Well, if you make the trench big enough, then you've just split your system in to two quantum Hall states. So that's, well, you made two out of one. If you make it very close, basically, electrons can tunnel, and so they basically make the system back again. And then their bright idea is you put, again, a superconductor in the middle, so shades of Kataev, and then things couple but they couple in a different way. Super. So here they just couple because they're close and electrons can tunnel. So the point is electrons can tunnel here, but only Cooper pairs can tunnel through here. And so what they showed then is exactly these edge modes I just described here can arise right there. And then you can make, just like we did for Kataev, you can make more and more of these. 
So it was really remarkable. I was stunned. I was just having fun with uh, algebra, and then they showed that this is at least conceivable. This is uh, even more difficult. There's some aspects of this that make life maybe easier, but, uh, but this is not, not inconceivable at all for people to do. Because this doesn't require any fancy P plus IP superconductor, the more re these fancy quantum Hall states that have non-abelian statistics. These are easy to make. Um, superconductors are, of course, easy to make. Uh, putting them together is the hard part, but anyway. So that's what, so that's what they do. So, um, so then you end up with this, let me just put in something, because this result just dazzles me. I'm not gonna explain where this came from, but you go through their analysis, you get this, where it says when you're thinking about how the interplay between the fractional quantum Hall effect and the superconductor, there's a precise sense in which your Cooper pair of the superconductor, so that's charge 2E, you've got two electrons. Um, Can be com is comprised in this region in the middle here. So the ones that are tunneling uh, through it is comprised of three charged two-thirds particles. Which I think is just unbelievably cool. So anyway, so, and so you can look at their papers, or actually you can look at the, we, Jason explains this very nicely in the review we wrote together. Yeah, so they would be, so if you did the break, so if you did, if you could make a network of these, like I explained for icing, then you would get, instead of getting just ones and minus ones, you would get, uh, you would get these roots of three. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Topological memory. No, because it's an interacting system. I mean, that's the state. I mean, you could ask that about any of these systems. Can you construct? I mean, so you can take invariance. So the only systematic results are, you know, like these Fikovsky and Kataev and like the things Frank mentioned um, this morning, this idea you start with the fermions, but then you you know, add in interactions and see that these things classify in a certain way. Um, but that's very partial. But here we know nothing. And in fact, um, an obsession of mine that I can tell you, so I mentioned with the Kataev, there's this thing called the Fafian. Um, and so there's a generalization of this to parafermions, which would be the correlator of parafermions object. This is an object Reed and Rezaei, um came up with an exact expression for. And so one of my uh, obsessions that when I talk to mathematicians, everyone tells me this is possible. And so, you know, like I say, it's a good thing if people tell you it's impossible, that's either, you should either give up or, or try even harder because maybe you'll find something interesting to try and make some sense of that object like the Fafian is. Uh, that's, uh, I, can, I can babble about that more. But anyway, the, the correct answer to your question is no, there's no, ana no known analog to, to this sort of topological invariant here. There's nothing, there's nothing. I say there's an analog of the Fafian in one particular context and perhaps that could be reinterpreted, but I don't know how to do that. Well, so uh, there is no name. It's the, so the, a Fafian comes up, so if you do just free fermion correlators, they're given by this Fafian matrix, it turns out. Um, that's, that's the approach by which this whole McCoy and Wu book to the icing basically uses that fact. So free fermion correlators are Fafians of a, ma of a given matrix. You, you, so in other words, uh, when you compute a correlator, the, the analysis shows that you'll get the Fafian of some matrix. The analysis to show precisely which matrix, but it's a Fafian. And then the Fafian is that formula I gave, um, the square to the determinant, this, this formula I wrote down. So, but it's, in conformal field theory, you just take the correlator of a bunch of fermions and you get a Fafian. That's how Moore Reed built their wave function. Um, so there's correlate, there's parafermionic conformal field theories that were pioneered by Fateyev and Zamologikov a long time ago, again in the 80s. And so then you can look at the correlators of the parafermions. These operators on the lattice turn into fields and in, fields in the conformal field theory, and you can look at their correlators there, and they satisfy a formula that actually was Reed and Rezaiu worked out. Reed and Rezaiu used that formula then to build uh, generalized, 
wave functions. In fact, um, for those of you who have heard some of these things, there's these famous Moore Reed fractional quantum Hall state, which has uh, 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 filling fraction five halves, and that has these non abelian Majorana particles. And I also mentioned P plus IP superconductor. And formally, the P plus IP superconductor and the Moore Reed state are very closely related. There's some more degrees of freedom in the uh, Moore Reed thing. And so, in a, in a somewhat vague but not completely meaningless sense, what we did here is uh, to the Reed Rezaei fractional quantum Hall states as the P plus IP superconductor is to Moore Reed. And for those of you who don't know what any of those words mean, just ignore that statement, but maybe a few of you do. All right, any other questions? Yeah, let me get back. Uh, I digressed, but that's okay. It's the last lecture. Okay, so I wanted to say that. So there's a whole story there, and people have proposed some nice stuff. I think those, I mean, people are still struggling in the lab to get Majorana, so this is some years off, but this is, again, a, not, not inconceivable. There was even a paper I wrote with, J actually, all these people, and actually, I think, most of those people and some more people, 11 authors, where we talked, to, made a proposal how you could even come up with a two-dimensional version of this idea just by coupling. So you keep digging more trenches and you couple that one to that one, make an array of these things, so get a fully two-dimensional thing. Anyway, so that's a, that's a great story, but uh, let me go back to something a little more formal. So um, this, this story I want to ask now. So, okay, so I, look, just to remind you where we were. So I, I wrote, I had this three-state pots uh, chain written in terms of tau's and sigmas. I then uh, rewrote it in terms of parafermions. Simple to see that then you get these edge modes when you set h equals zero. So remember, well, we write it. We have alpha one commutes with the Hamiltonian. So if you remember what we did for icing now, again, that's easy to show in icing, but then what was also easy to show in icing is if you now add in H, so what happens now to alpha one? Well, with H, well, you get something, just like with icing. It's more complicated already um, than you get, you'll get something, you'll get like alpha two, but then you'll get alpha one dagger, alpha two dagger with some coefficients, easy to work out. So it's already looking nasty, but if you remember the trick was, um, aha, so what we did now is we found something else that wish you computed alpha one plus something else, which will then give you, well, we have that alpha two dagger plus so we would get then minus alpha one, alpha two dagger. And the key thing, this would be order H over J, because that was order H. And then that would be order H, two dagger. And then give you something plus order H squared over J squared. And then you would just keep going and make, make it all work. That's how we did it, if you remember, I did the whole thing. Well, so the remarkable thing is you do that here and you find out you can't even do this. Which looks bizarre. I mean, you think in the universe I can find some object that commutes with H and gives me that back to cancel it, but you can't. It just doesn't exist. It's easy to see. So you scratch your head. So the physics there, so this does not disturb this fact here. So this is now the distinction between what I mentioned last time. There's this weak zero mode, which says it's some operator that changes the spectrum there. So a strong zero mode would be the one that maps each level to each level up to the exponential splitting. But the weak zero mode only does that, only interchanges the ground states. Maybe it does some low-lying states, but it doesn't do the whole spectrum. And so this still exists here. So in that sense, this is still topologically ordered. And so all the stuff I told you here is still fine. What I just told you now doesn't eliminate any of that, but it does say something peculiar. And so let me, so now I can give you a really simple qualitative 
picture much less fancy than what I just said to understand why this is so. So let's go back to icing momentarily. Right. Yeah. Very, very. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so, right. So there are operators that interchange the ground states. There's obviously lots of operators that interchange the ground states. But so the ground states are still there. You still have the ground state degeneracy, but you don't have this other stuff. Okay. So, but let me explain why that is. Let's go back to icing. And so let's understand just with cartoons. What's going on? And this is, again, to emphasize why spin systems are useful in thinking about it. So we can think about an icing. We've got two ground states. You know, and I, I talked about taking linear combinations, but let's just ignore that. There's two ground states. Um, again, in the extreme, a, in, in the H, this is the ground states at H equals 0. Okay, so now I, I, I constructed this zero mode operator, all this fancy stuff, to show you why these two, um, in fact, were degenerate up to exponential small corrections. But there's a really easy perturbative way to say this. So those are exact ground states um, when h equals zero. Well, now let's think perturbatively. Do perturbation theory. Well, in the term that we neglected. So remember, that was minus h times sigma xj. Okay. Well, so I do perturbation theory. Fine. I apply one of these things. I can flip one of those spins. Well, great. You can flip one of those spins, but that doesn't mix these two ground states. So you do perturbation theory. You can compute. You can compute a correction. You all learned how to do perturbation theory in quantum mechanics. All right, this is many body, but still it's easy. So you have to sum up all the spin flips, but you get a correction. First order perturbation theory, something order H. But the point is, because of the Z2 symmetry, the order H correction to the energies is the same for both ground states for plus, plus, plus and minus, minus, minus. So is that obvious, right? You, everyone, so imagine doing the first order perturbative calculation. You have a, actually you have to do sec, uh, you have to do second order because you have to go there and go back again. So it's second, so I should say, so it'll in fact be an order h squared, but the uh, order h vanishes. Is that clear? Any questions about that? So you just do perturbation theory. You can only flip one spin, so there's no matrix element, put it this way. There's no matrix element, sigma x, cannot take you from ground state one to ground state two, right? No way. Well, obviously, I go to third order, fourth order, eighth order. I can flip one spin at each order, but I'm still never going to mix these two. So even for any power, uh, uh, let's use power uh, L for L less than L, you can't, it, this will still be zero. I have to go, so sorry, the sum, okay. So to get this matrix element to be non-zero, I have to go to l order and perturbation theory. I have to flip all L spins. So finally, these two mix, and you get a correction. But so finally, the corrections to the energy our order h over j to the l. And that's what we show. I mean, we showed that explicitly by constructing that operator, but you don't need to even construct that operator to see that. Okay. So that's, if you wish, already a statement about you know, topological order. I mean, this, this, this shows you why those two things are kind of robust. That's already a really good sign. And again, the, I mean, translated back into the fermion. I mean, I, something I tried to emphasize, the Fermi and Hamiltonian and the Bosonic Hamiltonian are identical. It's just how you interpret things physically. So this statement that the two levels are split only to order 
uh, only at order capital L in perturbation theory. That's, that's, that's true for the fermionic version as well. Just the, it's much easier to see why that's so in the spin language. Okay, and so now for the excited states, So let's think now again at, let's go back again to h equals zero. Anyone know what's, what would be the lowest lying excited state? The lowest energy excited state at h equals zero? Or which ones? So flip one spin. So this is a candidate. So you're saying flip one. Say something like that. Is that right? Yeah, so this is actually not, this would be energy 2J, right? Or I guess 4J, the way I define. Yeah, 4J. Right, because I've, I've broken two bonds here. So the lowest line states look like that. And so this is a domain wall or a king. Right. And because I've taken my free boundary, if I had fixed boundary conditions, I'd have to do this. So you can think of this would be order 2J. But I mean, this is still the right idea, but just think of this now. And so I've got, I've got a bunch of them, L minus one kinks, because I can put them wherever I want. Okay. Well, so now again, so let's look at this. Let's look at this state and do the same argument I just did for the ground state. Well, again, I've got a bunch of states here, but I've got two kinds of states. I've got states that are like this one, but of course, the Z2, remember the Z2 symmetry is spin flip, so then there's one exactly that it's the spin flipped version of that. And so now we can ask the same question. If you take a state and you take its spin flipped version, to what order in perturbation theory do I need to go to mix these two and see a correction? All right, so is the energy of this state, again, to perturbation theory, equal to the energy of this state once I add the H's back in. And again, the argument is now completely identical, right? Because I can flip one. Now I can move this kink around. So in other words, this kink, this one, and the one there will have very basic the same energy. And those will mix under perturbation theory. So if I flip that spin, I move it over. But notice I don't get to that. The only way to get from here to here is again, you have to flip all L spins. So the splitting in energy is order H over J to the L. And then for these states too, you can keep making these arguments. At some point, you have to talk about states that are, you know, have a macroscopic number of these kinks are domain walls, so then these arguments don't work. But at least for anything of zero energy density, so any finite number of these kinks, you can make this argument, and you see that the energy splitting is there. And so this why explains, at least is a good sign, why there's a strong zero mode. This is necessary for there be to or a strong zero mode. So where every time you have a state and then it's Z2 conjugate state, they have the same energy. Okay. So that's, that's icing. So now let's rerun this for the three state case. Okay, so we've got three states which I'll call A, B, and C. And so again, the spin language is where this is all much better than the parafermions. 
go through three ground states at h equals zero. Well, all A's, all B's, and all C's. So now there's the Z3 symmetry that relates all of these. Actually, there's an S3 symmetry, so not only cyclic, all can interchange two or cyclically permute them. Okay, and so now the argument that I made for the ground state is exactly the same, all right? To get from, I add now the H not equal zero term in, that cyclically permutes one of these spins, either up or down, you can do either way. But the point is, to get from this to this to this requires l order again. So to mix has to be l order. So then the corrections are again order h to the l. So this is why topological order survives. At least at small h. And so I told you, if, again, if you work out fancier stuff, you can see there's a phase transition at h equals j. It's actually not proved that something funny could happen before you get to j, because it's not exactly solvable, but there's lots of suggestions. The field theory is, there's a field theory limit, which is, turns out is integrable, and there's lots of things you can say. So there's no evidence whatsoever in this model for anything happening before you get to h equals j. On the other hand, that's not, not a rigorous result. Okay, so, the, so like I say, at least this proves that it's small enough h, this will all survive. But now let's do the excited state one, because to get the strong zero mode, you need all the levels to obey this. And in icing, we showed that simple argument that did it. So again, here's the same deal. Well, we've got, instead of having, before we had two kinds of ground states, sort of plus minus kink or the minus plus that's kink, so in icing, there were two kinds of kink. There's the minus, minus, plus, 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 and then the plus, 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 minus, minus, minus. Well, so here, there's actually six, so three state pots. There's six, which, well, obviously will be uh, AA, BB, B, B, C, 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 A, A, and then the ones B, B, A, A, and all these always have dot, dot, dots, so we'll just start writing, uh, so C, B, and then uh, A, C, I'll put the kink there to label the kink, that, that's just a line labeling where the kink is, or the domain wall. All right, so nice, okay. But here, the argument breaks down. I can mix all six of these states in perturbation theory, because really this is six L minus one, six times L minus one, because right, I can move the domain wall. So okay, I can flip this one, and I can move the domain wall to there. And those just mix at first order in perturbation theory, okay. And the point in icing, you know, I can move the domain wall around, but I can never get the whole thing to go. But here it's different. So I can go from here, go to here, but then on the edge, I can just flip the edge one. That's just one more order in perturbation theory. So I can flip that one to that one. Right? I go all the way to the edge of the system and flip this. But now I can move this all the way back, the domain wall again, just by flipping them happily. And those are just first order, so those will all just mix under that. So I can move that kink to the other end. So then I just get C, A, A, A. Those are all the same energy. You form, I mean, to be precise, you form sort of a standing wave of all of the kinks, which is the same energy. All right, but then now I can flip the end one. So I guess I get this. All right? 
And then I keep doing this trick, and then I guess we'll go to B, C next, and then we go B, A, sorry, uh, then we move to the other end, then we go, oh, I, I screwed this. Yeah, so it's C, I, I screwed this. Uh, anyway, you get through all six. I screwed up the arrows. Should I back up? Or? Oh, okay. So let me let me draw the pictures bigger. Yeah, I was I was right. Let me draw the pictures bigger. Okay, so we have we have L minus one states of the states of the form A's, and then B, right? So these all mix under first order and perturbation theory. Well, think about it. that's just like hopping. So all L minus one of these type. Right? Or spin, I should say spin cycle. Right, so in other words, I just flip that spin or cycle that spin, and then you get that. So there's all L minus one. So is that clear, that part? All right, well now, okay, let's just, we stay in that space for a moment. We don't worry about what's happening. We turn off the edge flip, so all we can do is do this. Or make more kinks, which I'm not going to do. So just let's look about these. So, these all make, so you just form like a standing wave. Wave of these. And you'll get an energy, which will just be order H um, times some cosine K for all, I should say, H cosine K for all of these L minus 1 states. Right, so it's just like a hopping. So this is just like hopping. If you think of hopping of the domain wall, and if you don't believe me, just work it out. So that's so all those states. So that's why I said, meant when I said you know all these states are coupled. All right, but now again, just I can do this for the, all the states. Do this for all the A's with C states. Again, so turn off the thing that flips flips to C for a moment, and then so just do there. So again, you'll get some H cosine K prime for all those states. But the point, important point is all these states have only energy H. And they all mix. So now, if I just move this so move this guy down to the end think about that well then this guy just by flipping that to c mixes these two so flipping the flipping the edge spin or i should say cycling i keep saying flipping i shouldn't say flipping cycling the edge spin v to c mixes well, all the A, B kinks with all the A, C kinks. And just by going to one order in perturbation theory. And now I can keep doing this with all six kinds. And so all six mix. So again, this is just, it's a nice exercise. It's in the appendix of a paper. We say this in words in this review article I mentioned. And then there's a, re well, you can look up the reference. There's a paper I wrote. Uh, with Jason and his crew, which does that. Cal the calculation I just described in words, you can just do in detail. And so you find that all these states mix under there. And so the degeneracies, the splitting between different states is just order H over J, but just times one over L. So instead of being exponentially small in L, it's just one over L. So I say, so the only 
To do this calculation precisely, the only thing you need to do is neglect the processes that would create two of these kinks. And then you just have this vector space and you diagonalize it. So that explains, just in perturbation theory, this fact, this bizarre fact that I mentioned that the strong zero mode dies. for any h greater than zero, only the weak survives. So I guess one way it's bad naming, the strong die, the weak, the weak live in this case, but uh, they, they sneak through or the strong uh, gets bashed to pieces by the, uh, by the thing. Uh, yeah, so maybe that's a good time to break and then, uh, oh, well, well, any questions on this before I break? Okay, so see you in a few minutes. Okay, so uh, let's finish it off. I, I'm going to shift gears in a second, but I wanted to make uh, one more comment about this. So, you know, again, there's a tendency in theoretical physics, you know, you, someone writes down a simple model uh, like uh, Kataev's, and then someone else like me says, I'm going to generalize, you know, Z2 to Zn. Like I said, I was doing it mostly for academic interest. I thought it was, would be kind of cool to see what happened. Um, the, the payoff there was pretty good because found that the physics doesn't go through automatically, a useful lesson. So, I, you know, there is the standard physics mode of proof. You prove it for SU2, you prove it for SU3, and then declare victory. But this shows you go to Z2, from, Z, from Z2 to S3, and uh, it all goes, well, I mean, most of it goes through, so you learn a lot, but then there's this interesting thing I just said that uh, the strong zero mode goes away. Um, then there's another, I mean, there's uh, another reason to uh, generalize is because even in simple models, th there's a richer space of models. And so one of the things I want to point out, so, uh, you know, in icing, what, what I wrote down was the simplest um, sort of uh, thing you can write down there with nearest neighbor interactions. And you can write down more complicated ones. Remember we had the sigma y's and all that, but the physics of that from the topological point of view is more or less all the same. But in the, uh, in, in the Z3 case, there's actually something different you can do with this nearest neighbor Hamiltonian. So I made a point of saying, well, now we don't just have spin flip, we have to cycle the spin. So we have to have the tau and the tau dagger. That's what you got from the three state pots model. But then in the, Z3 case, you can do something more general. 
you can add a chiral interaction. So this breaks time reversal symmetry and very, very easily. Uh, so phi not equal to zero or theta not equal to zero breaks time reversal symmetry, makes spatial parity as well. It's easy to see. So in other words, um, left these pictures up here. So the energy, if you add this, it's easy to see, just work out the energy of an AB kink is no longer equal to the AC kink because we've broken the S3 symmetry that permutes the 3 ABC is now just a Z3. You can cyclically permute them. They're all the same. But notice, this isn't a cyclic permutation. This has a, is the Z3. And so actually, that turns out it's a way to salvage the strong zero modes. So it's one of the other things we did in these papers is you show, at least th there appears to be, so we haven't proved. So I proved that to all orders in perturbation theory, you can do that iteration. What I couldn't prove is that it's normalizable, and I'm not sure, now, then I thought it was, now I'm not so sure. But at least um, in perturbation theory, you do get the strong zero mode. And it's easy to see in this picture, the argument I just gave breaks down because this kink has higher energy. So fine, I can do this, flip to this, but remember the argument relied, now I have to move it back to the other end. And this energy is, well, one of them is greater than the other. And so all six don't mix. So the strong zero mode at least can live. So the moral that I like is that you add this phase in and uh, qualitatively new stuff happens. And maybe you shouldn't be surprised, you're breaking an important symmetry. Um, this model, I love this model, it's called the chiral clock model. There's an integral case called the chiral Potts model, a sub, you have to tune the parameters appropriately, and has all this rich behavior that uh, really hasn't been explored until maybe now a little because of this parafermion business, people have explored it a bit. But it's, it's a rich story, and the moral I really like, it's that uh, you know, it's always good to just vary existing things. Then look if you get anything interesting. If you don't find anything interesting, fine, move on and do something else. But Sometimes you find something interesting. Okay, so any questions on that story before I move on? Okay, so I had promised last time I'd say something about Fibonacci anions, so, and I thought, well, you know, it might be fun to just give a very brief overview of what I think is some really remarkable connections between different kinds of physics. So the ostensible thing that fits in with these lectures is braiding and fusing anions. If it's not obvious why I use the word braiding, I'll explain that in a minute. But fusing means to take two of these anions and put them together and analyze what happens. But it turns out mathematically, this is an incredibly rich story. And it relates um, in exceptionally beautiful way, and it's, it's the mathematical structure of this is essentially um, the same as that of 2D rational conformal field theory. I think the rational came up briefly in Slava's talks. What that means is when you have these expansions, there's a finite number of terms in the, what's happened, what's called a rational conformal field theory, and in the 2D case. And what also turns out to be deeply related to integrable lattice models and there's some beautiful old work that explains this and um, I'm in the midst of a series of papers on uh, topological defects to put a plug a part one came out we'll see how long it takes for part two it will be written part two will make this sort of more general connection very clear, although we talked a little bit about it in part one. So that was a paper I wrote a month or so ago. And also something, a more mathematical story, but that are the story of not and link invariance. So if you've heard of the Jones polynomial. So again, I could have given five lectures on all this whole story, which would have been fun, but maybe too formal for most people's taste, but anyway, but all these through all these four things 
um, have in common the same mathematical structure. I'm just going to give you the name, so if you hear it, you can say you know what it is. In the same way as, uh, you know, again, if you know some geometry in mathematics and, you know, you, and you hear string theorists use the word bundle all the time, but for many field theorists over the years, you just translate, when someone says bundle, you just have to learn this dictionary, you translate it to some language you know, and for most field theorists, that was the language of instantons and gauge theories. And essentially, it's all the same stuff. You, you, you do understand what a bundle is, even if you don't know those words. And so again, now when you hear uh, the words modular tensor category, if you s understand any one of these four things, then you actually know what a modular tensor category is. Anyway, so let me, so what I was going to describe is basically give you a very, very brief overview of that. You know, how much time have we got left? About a half hour left, so I think I could give you an overview. What? So, uh, uh, so inter yeah, so, um, so I've used the word exactly solvable, which actually uh, is, is applicable to icing, so sometimes people use the word exactly solvable. I don't, I don't like the word icing is exactly solvable, but so there's a set of lattice models in two dimensions, Baxter being the king of this domain, and um, which you can do certain exact calculations. In. And so icing being a, a canonical example, but icing is very special because it has this free fermion thing and you can actually do a lot more. Um, a famous example would be the, what I mentioned before, the spin a half Heisenberg chain. It's either two-dimensional classical lattice models or one-dimensional quantum chains. And so there's words, I mean, I could, I could have answered your question, oh, it has an infinite number of conserved currents, but I, I prefer the operational definition is that you can do um, sets of exact calculations in them. And so if the beta on SOTS, for example, is one of the chief tools. So if one definition, which isn't quite right, but captures the flavor is, it's models which you can analyze via the beta on SOTS. No, that's, that's why I don't like the word exactly solve, words exactly solvable, which Baxter used, so he's a god, he can do whatever he wants. But, um, uh, but in these models, you can often do things like calculate the uh, bulk free energy, so the ground state energy, for example, exactly. You can sometimes, if it's critical, compute some dimensions of operators, sometimes not, and not all of them. And so there's various things you can compute. That's what Baxter's book is about, these techniques that, uh, well, many people, but especially him, uh, designed over the decades to compute things. That's a whole long story. And, and this is a big deal now, people doing quantum quenches. I guess nothing we didn't hear about. Maybe it was last year's school. is a lot about quantum quenches or something like that. And the, there's all, all these special properties. So I guess roughly speaking, there's an infinite number of conserved charges. And so thus, you can compute stuff exactly, exploit those. Good. So that's, this, that's a, a very schematic picture. Let me at least say, um, since we did talk about braiding, I didn't use the word braiding, um, I used the word exchange, but remember the big deal was that I said, you know, you take one particle, one thing I called an anion, and then I move it around another, so I exchange. But if you imagine this in space-time now, so this is 2D space, the 2D space-time, well, I've got two, but now we're going in time, so if I imagine I exchange the two, well, that's what it looks like in space-time. Now, I can't draw three dimensions, but if instead of looking at just space, I project my three-dimensional space-time onto two dimensions, what this will look like is that in space-time. So when I go around, well, <laughs> I'm not geometrically good. So when I do this, that's either a braid or an anti-braid, I guess. Yeah, yeah, for, from your point of view, I guess I did it right. That's, that's what that is, right, as I do this in time, okay? So this is obviously looks like a braid, and that's where already it's obvious why the connection to knot and link invariants comes up because what happens when you're trying to compute a knot invariant, you take the, your three-dimensional collection of links or knots, and then you project it down onto the plane, and when you do that, you necessarily have stuff like that. And then if you're going to compute a knot in Lincoln variant, of course, the answer better not depend on which plane you project it onto. So that's that story. 
Um, so that's where the braiding comes up. Um, that's, that's why the word's braiding, if you just imagine these in, in space-time. So already now we can see a consistency condition. So the point is, I can't just write down these things randomly. So when I'm doing the braiding, or the exchanging like I did, you have various consistency conditions. And one of them I can draw right here. Well, it says, say I have three particles. Okay? And, you know, now let's, let me draw it in. Let's go a little lower here. Again, let's think about doing it in time. So I projected, so one dimension of space was out of the board. That's what I've projected. So this direction is space. This direction is time. And this is the space. So now, say I do this thing. So I, I take this particle. Well, I first braid it with this one. Okay. So let me draw, let me draw this one going straight up. All right. And then I braid it with this one. And again, it's important which order. And then say, let, let, I want to do this one is going to go like that. Okay, so I do three braids. First braid, one, two. So if you wish, I write them in order. I do braid one, two, braid two, three, and then braid, uh, sorry, braid one, three, and then braid two, three. Well, I can braid these things in a different order, too. I can take, um, well, I can do the same three braids, but I can do them in a different order. So again, let me draw that one there. But say I first decide to braid uh, uh, this way. So that's one, two, three. Uh, wait, I'm, I'm confusing myself. Let me, let me draw the picture, and then I'll say it in words. So I first want to braid two, th uh, two, three. Then I braid one, three, and then I braid one, two. So this is the same three braids, but two different orders. But now again, the key word for my lectures is topological. The whole point of this is I want to do these very far apart. I don't want them to come close enough so that they interact. Okay, so these braiding things, this had better be equal. And here's the reason why. It's because now just imagine I just drag this path through here. And this I can do adiabatically. Remember that was how we got bosons and fermions to begin with. I drag this path through. Well then, it just looks like exactly like this. I can continuously deform that to that. Okay, is that clear? My, I drew my pictures correctly, right? So you just drag this one through. This one's always on top. That one's always on the bottom. And then this one stays there. So topologically, those two are the same. You can redefine your rates to get these two. So these two have to be equal. Okay. And so this is a consistency condition on your on your braiding, on, on what happens to your wave function under exchange. Now, uh, this, if you know a little bit about knot theory, this is called the third Reitermeister move. So again, when you're trying to compute in knot theory, what the idea is to compute an invariant. So you have some spaghetti, tangle of knots and links, and you want to compute something so that different links that are topologically the same. So again, you can move around your knots, um, but without uh, cutting anything and rejoining, and, and you'll get the same knot. So that's what a knot invariant is. It will only depend on uh, the topology of what's going on, not just de continuous deformations. Well, so this is obviously continuous deformation. This will happen just depending with different projections of the same knot. You'll get both of these, and so this better be equal. And that's what Reitermeister a long time ago showed had to be an invariant. So it's called the third Reitermeister move. Um, again, to mention this thing, for those of you who do know something about integral models, this looks an awful lot like what's called the Yang-Baxter equation. 
Um, this is actually a special limit of the Yang-Baxter equation, but it shows why the things are connected. If you don't know what integral models are, ignore that comment. Okay, so that's an example of a consistency condition. So now that's the braiding. Um, might as well, I'll quickly draw the second Reitermeister move. which just is basically the following. I braid, but then I do the other braid. So this would be like braid, and that's, call that braid inverse. Well, that has to be equal to that. And that's obvious from the picture. You just drag those two apart. So again, these are consistency conditions on everything that's going on. But then what turned out when Jones came up with his famous polynomial in the 80s, Turned out this idea of fusing, even though it's not obvious from just braiding, turns out to be really important. And anions give you a nice way of seeing what fus fusion is. So it just says, from the point of view of statistics, Um, how, how does a, a pair of anions behave? And so what I mean by this is say I take two anions here. They're still far enough apart so they're not interacting. But I take maybe another two anions over there and I bring both of these around. Well, what happens? So here's a simple example to show that this is not a trivial problem. All right, so consider what people have named a semion. And a semion is when you take two particles and interchange them. I pick up a factor instead of minus, you would pick up one for a boson, minus one for fermion. Well, this is kind of the next simplest thing. You pick up a factor i, so that's the semi, okay? So people say, well, sort of like half a fermion. But, so that's a semion. So say I have two semions here, and then two more semions here. But now I move these two over there. What happens to the wave function? Nothing. Nothing's what? Well, is it minus or nothing? Yeah. So Richard says, so Richard's right. So because there's four, there's four involved, right? So this one goes around, that one picks up an I, but it goes around, that one picks up an I. So if I took one around, I'd pick up a minus. If I take two around, I get two minuses, so I get one. So here's, that's why I said this is already peculiar. So two semions do not make a fermion. Two semions make a boson. Oh, sorry, it's two, sorry, it's two. No, I'm not, uh, oh yeah, I, oh, uh, no, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah, good, right. So again, these are very far apart, so you're right, I have to, it, let's not worry about framing. <laughs> yeah, so I guess the way I drew it, I'm keeping these two fixed, so that one would, yeah, look like that, and then that one would have to look like that. Yeah, they're very far apart, so we're not going to worry about them. Anyway. Yeah, you have to pay attention to these things. He's worried about, it, it depends, you, you twist these, but it, a, a twist by just pi is ambiguous anyway, so you have to twist by 2 pi, but anyway, you get the drift. But that was my point. This is a trickier, once you start doing these things, it's a trickier problem. And this, these are the rules that tell you what to do. So what you have to do now is define a vertex. And so this is, just tells you what happens. I have two anions, one kind labeled by A, other by B. 
Remember, we got non-abelian ones too. That semion was just. And we define that vertex. And so now we can express all the braiding and fusing in terms of these vertices. And in fact, you have to to define this precisely. So again, a tangent here where, where um, this comes in. So if you look at how to define the conformal blocks in a rational conformal field theory, you have to understand these things. So in the rational conformal field theory, what I'm calling anions here are the, are the chiral operators. And this is basically telling you what happens in the OPE. And so, for example, what you will define is a coefficient. What we will say is you have phi A. So this is, well, it's just, it's called. we have an anion A or a field in the conformal field theory. Fuse, so this means fuse with C. Well, then the question is, what do you get? Right? So you get some Cs. But in general, you can get a sum over a bunch of Cs. So A and B can fuse to two different things. And so the example we had already in icing, we did a great length. We had this edge mode, which I will label by sigma. And notice we have two edge modes, and we have this two-state system. So this is an example of what happens when I, I take my two edge modes, I'll label each one by sigma, and then when I look at them behave together, they behave together like a quantum two-state system. That's what we showed at great length. And so what you'll get here are these are non-negative integers. Sum over all possible C. And so again, the connection with fields now um, what this NABC says is if you have two fields, one you label by A, one by B, you do an operator product, what NABC tells you is not the operator product coefficient, so not the thing Slava was using to derive. It just tells you is C in there or not. And then there's a number, which is the precise coefficient. That has to do with, um, well, you have to define some conventions, and you have to work through it, and it satisfies all these consistency relations, and that's what among the things he was exploiting. But on the other hand, this statement is a much cruder statement, but much simpler statement, does C appear or not? And this, in, for most simple examples, this will be zero or one, but for lots of examples, uh, there you can have more complicated one where there's twos. And those of you familiar with uh, group multiplication theory, you know, in SU3, you can get multiplicities and things like that. Just means that I can take there's two ways of fusing. I have two anions, and you know they fuse to there, but there's two ways of doing that. Just like when you take representations, you, know, you do group multip uh, well, gr uh, representation multiplication, or tensory product of representations, you can just get the same representation twice. It just says there's two ways of, two way, two ways of forming invariance. In this uh, SU2, this doesn't happen, but. Uh, yeah, it's just, this is what the rules lead you, you know, the rule, you're trying to be the most general thing and you find that you can construct, you know, the simplest examples don't have this, but not that complicated ones do. Okay, yeah, good, any other questions? So this is the basic idea. So again, now you have to satisfy constraints. And sorry, what theory? In Knott's theory. Well, you don't, when you're just writing down your link, but then when Jones was deriving this, basically he showed that the structure to de define his polynomial, he didn't quite have, he didn't ever have to do that, but I think even he knew originally and very quickly people realized is this setup, um, the setup involving fusing was absolutely the right way to see it. I can't remember. Well, the original paper is about subfactors, so it's hard for physicists to understand. But very quickly, certainly he probably knew it from the beginning, but very quickly realized that was the way, the right way to even think about what he was constructing. And then at that, that point, 
in integrable lattice models, there was this whole structure of quantum group algebras being developed and it was really quickly realized. It's a fascinating historical story. All these things happened independently around the same time. The quant well, the quantum group approach to integrable lattice models, rational conformal field theories and not Lingen variance. And the origins of all three are completely different and it's all the identical mathematical structure. It's truly remarkable. It all happened in, in the early to mid 80s. And, um, and it's all, and then in the late 80s, people kind of put it all together that these were all the same thing. Yeah, that, that's the word the mathematicians used to name the structure uh, um, there. So, yeah, I wouldn't even, I won't explain what a category is, but anyway. It, it, it's called an algebra. It's, it's more or less like an algebra. It's more complicated. It's broader notion than an algebra, but for physicist purposes, you can think of it as like an algebra. Once you get used to it, it's actually a useful language, but yeah, it takes a little getting used to. Um, yeah, again, do what I said like with the instantons. You know, you map it on, for a while you just map it onto something that you know. And so, yeah, for years when people said category, I just meant algebra. And finally at some point I realized, ah, okay, there's some notions you, that are useful to generalize that the algebra doesn't cover. Oh, actually, I can tell you one. So for example, you take two particles like A and A bar, and you fuse them together to be nothing. So that's a notion that wouldn't exist in an algebra where you take two generators and just poof, make them go away. But anyway, so that's why you need a category. Okay, good. I'll, yeah, I'll get to, well, I'll get through uh, over in time. So again, there's more consistency equations. And then there's something that's, it's not exactly what people usually call the Pentagon equation, but this is an easier to draw version. And what it says is, okay, I take two particles, I fuse them together and say I scatter them with a third. All right. Well, but again, everything's supposed to be topological, so I could have just scattered before I fused them. And so that this is equal to this. And there's that consistency condition. So all these give this elaborate set of consistency conditions. And again, like if you've ever tried to solve an integrable model, this Yang-Baxter equation is a strong constraint on it. And it looks like a completely miracle um, you, you solve it. So even in simple cases, you get like, you know, 64 equations with three unknowns. And here, if you write everything out by brute force, it just looks insane. But the structure is there, and when you and when you work through the structure, you see that there are solutions to the structure. It wouldn't be very interesting, obviously, if there weren't. Um, and so you find that there are solutions to this equation. So let me just give you, since I said I would say what a Fibonacci anion is. Okay, well, actually, I have time. I'll, I'll tell you quickly how I would write out what's going on in icing, and then I'll, I'll say what the... So in icing, what happens is we just basically have one non-trivial vertex, which would be like take sigma, sigma, and fuse to psi. Again, it's topological, I can make my lines point. In more complicated cases, you have to put arrows on there, but these examples you don't. Sigma, sigma, psi. And there's a sigma, then the other ones are like sigma, sigma, one, there's a psi, psi, one, and then you can rotate all these around. But those are basic, I guess we have the really boring one, 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 one. So one, so one in this context, one means no anion. Okay. And then sigma is our edge mode. And psi is just the fermion operator. So it's the operator. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, psi would be an operator. It's the operator that, lay, that would, it would take you uh, from the one two state system to, uh, so if, it's, it's a question whether you think in the language of the states or the edge modes. But if, if you wish, 
the two, when you have the two edge modes, the way you should think of it, you have two edge modes for a given system, and then these are the two states that there. And so another fusion is if you take, yeah, okay, let me just stop it there. Yeah. Yep. Is this, yeah, well, no, no, sigma isn't a, I mean, this, this is where it gets, it's the object that has this non-trivial braiding. So that's why, yeah, I didn't, that's why I didn't write it as capital Psi. You have to think about, it's, it's, it's the object when you take them now and, and you know, shift them around each other, like I showed you with the networks. It's, it's the object that governs changing different, you know, things around. It's the process of doing this, if you wish. Well, yeah, so, so, so what it's saying is for any given system, I've got, I've got, got these things that I can braid around each other via the whole thing. So don't think of the operator, just think of this object. It's the object living at the end that lets us move it around. And so what I'm saying is when I, if that now I were to take this whole system and move it around another. I can't do that in my networks, but I can imagine doing that in, uh, uh, well, I guess I could do it in my networks. But if, if these were vortices in a superconductor. See, these two together form a two-state system, right? And so if I now took my whole two-state system and moved two vortices and moved it around another pair, these two together would behave like either a boson or a fermion. They give you this linear combination. And, and what you got would depend, because remember, you can have linear combinations of this two-state system. So what you would get would be, depending on whether these were, we, you put them in, say, the one state, then you move it around something else, and you would get nothing. Yeah, so, right, so good, let me, it's better to say this in the language of vortices. So if I do, the, so if these are again, two vortices here, so exactly the picture, right? So each vortex is like a sigma, but then say they would behave collectively, not as just one possibility like the semions, they would behave collectively as either one or psi. And collectively these guys can behave as one or psi or any linear combination. So now when I move these two around, this one, well, if I put both of these as the psi, then I would pick up a minus sign. If I don't, it depends. And, and the point is I have this freedom because that's my two-state system. And I can do, yeah, yeah, so, so I'm necessary. I apologize for being vague, you know, ask me if, if I can be a little bit more detailed, but yeah, running out of time, I want to say, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, it does. That, that's a vertex, too. I think I drew that one, too. Bye. No, right. So this is saying, so what that equation I wrote, oh yeah, let me write that down again. It says that when you put A and B together, I have two choices of what I can do. And, and so there's a whole literature on, you know, if you really could build one of these things, how could I put it in the state? So again, think about it. It's a two-state system. And so this braiding and fusing, you know, does which both of which you can do physically, is a way of t telling it you doing operations on your quantum mechanical system. And so what it's saying is, it's, uh, so it's, this is the heart of the bizarre notion, saying, you know, given these things, there's two, a quantum two-state system means there's two things it could be, and depending on how I set it up, it might be in either one or the other or even in some linear combination of those. Yeah, and so, right, that, that's the fundamental growth thing. Okay, good, good, well, We'll do a question time now and I'll make a few more, well, ask them a few more questions after. Let me just say a few more things. Okay, so you get these, you get these rules. And so let me just draw in pictures what the braiding in, you can define the braid matrix would then say, I have, these are my two particles. So say these are sigmas and sigmas from say different chains. And then what it says now, what I showed you in explicit matrices in this notation is that say I have, uh, 
a 1 here. Uh, sorry, say I have a sigma here. Well, then these confuse to 1 or psi, and I have a two-state system here, and then that has to be a sigma there again. And then the braiding, these two guys, looks like this. But then the catch is, oops. The catch is this one or psi can change to there. And that's exactly what we showed. We showed that we explicitly constructed the matrix that this linear combination goes to that, some linear, com this linear combination goes under the braiding, the matrix I called U before, so this would be like U, say if that were two and three, this would be U two, three, would go to that. So I obviously having to find these precisely, but everything I said before can be translated this language and then put it in the general, put it in the general structure. So I hope that at least evokes what's going on. And so now once you set up the structure, you can look for other rules. And I made a comment last time. I said the problem is I can do these braids and it's magnificent, but I can't get an arbitrary unitary transformation on my, on my space of states. Right, so I can do these braidings. I can get a lot of it, but I can't. And I mentioned this magical Fibonacci. So Fibonacci, it's really easy to write down the rules um, for this the fusion rules, because there's only one kind of particle. So here I had sigmas and psi's, so only one kind of anion, which I'll label by tau. Okay, and it obeys the fusion. I take two taus together. And so in the Ising case, I took two sigmas together and I got something simple. I either got a boson or I got a fermion. But that was still interesting because I can get either. But here it's even weirder. I can get a boson or I can get itself back when I fuse two taus together. And so that's already kind of neat because I get three while I get more. And you, you, you get numbers there. And those will be the Fibonacci numbers. That's why people call these Fibonacci anions. So this is the Fibonacci case. Um, but let's see. So let me just write out now. So the most general braid matrix you can have. So I have states here. So I have states here, A, B, and C. Well, so let me write out the four possibilities for down here. I have A, B, C, and then I'll take two taus there. So we have A, B, C can be either uh, one tau one. They can be, let me just get them in the order I wrote the matrix in. Tau, tau, one can be one tau, tau, or it can be tau, one, tau, or it can be tau, tau, tau. So those are the five possibilities for this, because I've got a tau there. So if that's a one, that has to be a tau. All that. And then now I do the braid. So I take that, and that gives a matrix on these five states. And then that braid matrix, I'll just write it down, and then I'm done. Just to show off. These are diagonal up to here. But then, all right, let me erase that. And then, so this is now in this five by five space of states. So Phi inverse is the golden mean, which I'll write out in this. Phi is the golden mean. Oops. And phi is the golden mean, which is 1 plus the square root of 5 over 2. And so that says what happens when you braid towels. But see, here's the way, this is what's unusual. It says you have to keep track. In order for this to make sense, you have to keep track of where, what kind of system these anions are in. So this is kind of keeping track, what these labels you should think of are is keeping track of what's going on in the system. 
And so remember, we had a two-state system. Now, in this anionic system, it's even weirder than that. The number of states is you increase the number of ones. Remember, I said for icing, so there are for two n zero modes. Remember, we had two to the n state system. But if you think about it from the point of view of particle physics, the way you would do it, we'd say if you had two n, if you have two to the n states, well, for n particles, then you would say the number of degrees of freedom is two. But here we have two n states and two to the n, sorry, two n particles and two to the n states. And so this has the weird characteristics that's square root of two to the two n. So this is sort of effectively the number of degrees of freedom is not an integer in this system. Well, if you do the same bit for these Fibonacci anions, you would get phi numbers of degrees of freedom. But anyway, but the point is mathematically, it's all completely consistent. And well, there are ideas on how to uh, realize this. All right, so I'll stop. But any questions? No. Whirlwind. All right, so then let me, first of all, before we fight, we have to thank the organizers for doing uh, all this work to get us all here in this nice place. The weather isn't so bad today. <laughs> uh, anyway, thanks, Filippo and uh, Andrea and Giuseppe, where Giuseppe's not here. I think nominally I was an organizer, but that was very nominal. So these are the guys who deserve the credit. So anyway, let's give them a round of applause to thank them.